interrupt you. <laughs> Sorry. This is, this is the worst, the, 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 you know, the bad thing about this gig, you know, leading classes or discussions or whatever is people are having a great time and they're talking and then I get to tell them to be quiet and listen to me, <laughs> you know. It's not the best thing, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in trouble already, right? Um, so, thank you for coming. Um, a couple of things to get to, to, to start off with before, I, I'll ask you all to introduce yourselves here in, in just a minute, um, but a, a couple of things to get going. You all did not get a bag, did you? Um, I was going to sort of give you a guided tour of the, uh, um, the class materials here. There's that. You have your own. And that. You don't have to you don't really have to do anything with them right now. I'll just tell you tell you what's in there. But first, I'm John Spicer. Um, those of you I haven't really had a, much of a chance to talk with, I'm hoping that will happen as time goes on. Um, it's very odd coming back from sabbatical and you know coming into the this environment and like, oh yeah, all the faces I don't really know, people I don't really know at all. So there will be chance to connect and do something with that as time goes on, but I'm just really glad you're here. And for those who are online, I'm really glad you're here too. Uh, the reason we're doing this class in here this time, um, as opposed to the other room, is so that we can have the um, digital component of it. Um, and so there may be people asking questions and such as we go, and if uh, Adam or, or Jen pipe up from the back with a question, that will be a question that somebody from the uh, virtual world is sharing with us. So. Uh, just know that that's there. Know that we're out there <laughs> on, on the live stream, which is why you have those microphones in front of you. It's not really so much that we can't hear each other in here because it's not that big a space. But if, you know, if you have a question or comment you want to make or something, it would be great. Am I not on? No, no. Actually, oh. I'm going to go ahead and turn all the microphones on. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. they're just on. Just pick them up and talk. That way it's not, it's not complicated. Yeah. And just know that people so you, on, everybody's on. You'll, be, you'll be amplified in the room, but it's not really for that as much as it is for folks listening uh, that way. But how about we just say hello to one another first. Um, Neil, would you mind just, we'll go around the table. That would be great if you wouldn't okay. mind. Just say, say who you are, um, how, how long you've been sort of in orbit in the <laughs> St. Andrews universe, how long you've been around here. Um, and that's probably enough. So just, yeah, just introduction. Okay, I'm Neil Douthat, and I joined the church uh, this last spring, actually. I've been uh, a different church for quite a while, a Presbyterian church, Village Presbyterian Church, and by virtue of having a good friend and uh, a fellow named Doc Worley here in the church, uh, I've gotten to know John, and we've had some wonderful conversations, and this just felt like home. And thank That's you, John. Oh, thank you, John. It very much feels like home. We've been at St. Andrews since mid-June, and um, we're both tired and retired after moving <laughs> boxes and unpacking boxes. So yeah. And, and your, your name? Would Carolyn. You? Yes. Sorry. My name is Carolyn Johnson. And I am Paul Johnson, who came with Carolyn <laughs> three months ago. And uh, we've actually been Episcopalians for a while. Um, and, you know, we wanted to become, we wanted to be part of this class because it seemed like a good way for us to get connected with more people in yeah. the church and things. Yeah. And, uh, and there's, there are always things to learn. That's so. for sure. Um, Rebecca Lahan, I've been hanging out in the back since last fall. <laughs> that is a great way to put it. I love that. And also a great way to find out about a church. Yeah. Right? Just kind of hang out in the back and see. Yeah. yeah. So um, I was with them, uh, I was a Methodist for 15 years. And so kind of okay. making a little bit of a change. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thank you. Do we want to continue? Or yeah, that's good. Uh, my name is Zach Beal. I have been around for five years and some change, and I work here, but it is my home away from home, so to speak. We're grateful for that. Uh, I'm Josh Paskowitz. I'm Zach's husband. So I actually started coming here off and on since 2014, though, for various reasons, So, but I've been here 
with Zach for five years. So, yeah. I'm Susan Painter. I came in August of 2018. I moved here from Virginia. I am currently the junior warden at St. Andrews, which means different things at different churches. At St. Andrews, it means I kind of represent the people in the pews. So I have my ears perked. To, if I need to tell Father John something that he needs to know, I have my sleeve ready for you to pull if there's something you'd like me to know and like me to pass on. Yeah. And I love being part of Discovery because I get to know you all. Hi, um, my name's Nathan Ferris. Um, my wife and I have been hanging out. We come a couple of times. We moved to 65th and Washington in March, okay. so it's walking distance, which we really like. Nice. Um, we yeah. moved, we're both from Kansas City originally, but we moved back here about two years ago and have sort of been trying to find a church since we moved back, so we're, uh, uh, but we've enjoyed it, and so we're still look, looking to learn more. So. Tim Dotteridge, a uh, little over a month. Is it a month? Yeah. So pretty new still, uh, but grew up uh, in the Episcopal Church. I grew up going to uh, St. Thomas and St. Michael's before that on the Kansas side. Okay. Live in okay. Overland Park. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Alyssa Raymond. I moved here about three years ago in the middle of the pandemic. Okay. So I visited a bunch of churches in person and online. It was very hard to actually figure out if I liked a place when none of the regular stuff was going on. Okay. Yeah. So. In some ways, I've lived here and I feel at home here, and in other ways, I'm finally getting to do some things around here for the first time. Wow. And I'm from more of a non-denominational background, so sometimes I'll ask him questions, and normally he knows, but other times he doesn't. And I'm like, <laughs> someone knows the reason for this. They didn't just like do it for no reason. <laughs> That's why I'm here too. Yeah. No, Sorry. Right. You're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. I mean, and I'm, everybody in here is from something of a different background. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, but I'm weird. You know, that's, that's not the typical course. I mean, there's some of us like that, but not, not very many. Um, if, you, if you did a survey of the folks in the room on a Sunday morning, I don't know, I would bet maybe 10%, 15% might have grown up in the Episcopal Church. I mean, it's, some of us are lifers, but most of us are not. And come from a lot of different, you know, some people from the kind of more Catholic side of the tradition, some people from non the non-denominational side of the tradition, some people from no tradition at all, and that's fabulous. Um, one of the things I hope we see tonight is the kind of the breadth of this way of being Christian. Uh, so anyway, more, more on that, maybe more than you want to know on that as we go. Let me tell you what's in your bag. Um, first of all, you have free books, so that's fun. You have a book of common prayer for your very own. This is the same thing as what's in the pews over there. Um, but this is for you to <laughs> read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. No. This is for you to make notes in, um, but also for you to take home and, and use as a prayer resource. I mean, it is the book of common prayer. And there's some beautiful, beautiful things in here. Um, one of the sessions we'll have is about the book of common prayer and scripture. And that session will give you sort of a guided tour of what's in the book. We won't do that tonight. But it would be a good thing to bring it um, to the class meetings. If you don't, don't worry about it. But it would be good to, to bring it. The other is this book, uh, Walk in Love. This is by a guy named uh, Scott Gunn and a woman named Melody Wilson Shobe. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a guide to what does the Episcopal Church think, pray, believe, practice about kind of the most fundamental parts of the faith. So there are chapters about theology, there are chapters about sacraments and sacramentality, about the church seasons, about uh, what the Trinity is about, finding your place in the church and taking your faith into the world. It's, it's good stuff. We're not going to, the class doesn't track, you know, week by week with this book or something, but it's a really good augment to the kinds of things we're gonna be discussing in here. So that, that's for you too. And then you have your binder, because what's, what's a class without a binder, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, in the binder, you'll find uh, the slides for tonight. If you're somebody who likes the slides, that's for you. If you're someone who doesn't like to follow along with slides, 
ignore it. That's totally fine. <clears throat> um, but the meat of the book is the, the booklet inside. Um, this is, excuse me, kind of a guide to, it, it's a short version of a resource like this, but kind of tailored to St. Andrews and tailored to um, at least one way this class, I hope, can be helpful, which is as a, as a journey toward deciding if you want to make some kind of commitment in your own spiritual life at the end of this experience. And we'll talk about that several times through the class about uh, what, what one might do. Um, so there's a sacrament of confirmation um, and other possible options. But that, this is a kind of a discernment guide maybe uh, to, to coming into this tradition and deciding, does it make sense for me to do something outward and visible to recognize coming into this tradition? And we'll talk about options for that. But uh, so I just would encourage you to look at the, the material in here related to what we're going to talk about on a given night. So the, you know, the class, uh, when, when we're going to do the Book of Common Prayer, you might take a glance at the material in here about the Book of Common Prayer, that sort of thing. And it just gives you um, some, some good Anglican uh, glossary items, uh, uh, Anglican speak, Episcopal speak. Uh, there's a, there's a, glo a long glossary in here of church-related terms because one of the things we'll kind of try to undo in this class a little bit is the, the reality that you come into a, a liturgical tradition, especially uh, worship in the kind of the style that we do here, and there are all these words that you never hear anyplace else, and it makes people feel excluded. Oftentimes, you know, if somebody's talking about you know, walk through the narthex to come to the undercroft, and you're like, what? <laughs> where, where would I do that, and why? Why would I want to? You know. So we'll hopefully unpack some of those things. Um, oh, one thing I should have said about material toward the end of the booklet. Let's see. At the end of the booklet, you will find a class schedule. So, last page. Um, tells you what's coming each time. Uh, it's at 6 o'clock each time, and there's dinner each time, and there's worship beforehand each time if you want to come. You don't have to. Uh, the class starts at 6 or so, or dinner does at least. And this will tell you what's happening each, each night of the class, as well as a couple of other dates there at the bottom. Uh, we're going to welcome whoever would like to be welcomed. Um, uh, people coming into this this church community will do that on Sunday, October 29th, and if you'd like to be part of that, we'd love to have you, and if you don't, that's perfectly fine, too. If you don't want to stand up in front of everybody, that's all right. Um, and Sunday, January 7th, is when our, our bishop is making her visitation. If you decide you want to be confirmed or be received into the church, make a commitment of some kind, that, that's the time to do it, when, when she's visiting, and we'll talk about why that would be the case, why we would care whether the bishop was visiting and how it might be something other than just like a check up on me, though it probably is that too, I don't know. <laughs> so there's the schedule and in the back pocket is this a little flyer with a QR code for a spiritual gifts inventory. That will get into more in session five, I think it is the, the um, what's the name of the session, sorry. Worship and go, yeah, which is intended to help you take your faith into the world. So that, that QR code will take you to a spiritual gifts inventory. Um, and there are lots of those out there. This is one actually developed by and for um, people in the Episcopal tradition. So it hopefully fits us relatively well. Um, but it's to help you see, you know, how has God gifted you in particular interests and particular skills and particular motivations to go out and be a Christian in the world. Um, anyway, more on that later, but you can take that anytime you want. It's free. Um, you can take it more than once and see if you get a different answer the second time, you know, <laughs> do whatever you want to do. That's it's fine. Private. It's private. It's, oh, yes, it's private. Too. You get it. You take the thing and it emails you a response um, immediately, I think. Yeah, pretty much immediately. Um, and you know, it's like any other assessment. You take it for what it's worth. And it, it, might, it might show you some interesting things. Let's see, 
What else? That's probably enough. There will be different people teaching this class through the, the these six weeks. I'll do a couple. Um, Mother Jean does one. Susan is doing one. Um, you're doing Book of Common Prayer, right? Yeah. And who's teaching with you? Somebody's teaching with you, right? Are you, are you doing that one by yourself? or? I'm, uh, sometimes it's combined with scripture. Yeah, I, don't know, I don't know who is teaching. But yeah, it, it is combined with scripture. Anyway, uh, Deacon Adams teaching one. So we'll have, we'll have several of us up here in front of you, which at least, you know, you won't find it boring. It won't be the same person droning on and on each time. And that's a good thing. Let's see. Is that enough introduction? Anything I haven't covered that I should have? probably enough introduction. Okay, so the first of these classes is Anglican identity, which raises an immediate question. I thought this was St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, right? So what does that even mean, Anglican? Um, is, and I will probably fall into saying that, saying that sometimes and saying Episcopalian sometimes, and, and that's okay because they are slightly different. But, but also in a way not. Anglican means related to Christianity as developed and practiced out of England historically. Anglican just means of England, right? So in talking about like an Anglican approach to something or Anglican history or heritage or whatever, it's, it's the churches that come out of the English experience. So there's also, that's definition one. Definition two in the dictionary would be out of church conflicts in the last couple of decades, um, a, a branch of conservative Episcopalians broke away and said, we don't like things that are going on in the Episcopal Church. We want to be on our own. We will call ourselves the Anglican Church, which is very confusing because, I mean, that's the name they chose for themselves, but it, but it isn't actually quite historically right, because the Episcopal Church is actually the, the, the church in the United States that's in communion, in unity with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the rest of the churches of the Anglican world. So anyway, when I say Anglican, what I'm referring to is the deeper history, the deeper connection, and the, 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 the identity of these ways of being Christian that you find similarly in churches across the globe, actually. And we'll see that later, um, because the English left their mark in lots of places. Okay, so that's not really the whole point of this of the, <laughs> this class, but but it is good to know what the word means, at least as I'm using it. So, but the point of this class is to talk about where where have we come from, um, and how has that journey sort of led us to where we are now. So if you like history, you'll get some history. If you don't like history, I apologize, and you won't get a whole lot more after. This class, I don't think. Whoops, there's my, oh, there's my. Okay, on we go. So if we're gonna figure out where we came from, it's good to know a little bit of uh, a background of where we started. This is, we're not gonna go all the way back to Jesus, but that's of course where we started. But this is, this is just a, an illustration of the spread of Christianity. And there's nothing here you need to remember particularly other than it is interesting how the blue, dark blue areas, that, that's illustrating Christianity at about 300 AD or so. The lighter blue is areas, it says areas Christianized 300 to 600, which not coincidentally um, coincides with Constantine and looks remarkably like the Roman Empire because it is the Roman Empire. Um, you may remember from you know high school or college history class, Constantine um, had a vision of the, the Christian God granting him victory in a battle and decided he would legalize Christianity as a consequence of the fact that he won. Um, sort of a thank you, I guess. I don't know how Constantine <laughs> saw it, but he, Christ, uh, he legalized Christianity. The emperors after him made it the state religion. And so all of a sudden, the, Roman em the map of the Roman Empire and the map of Christianity became one and the same. <sighs> Over time, was that a good thing? That's a whole other conversation. Um, I would say probably not, actually. Not a good thing. 
But it's, it meant Christianity spread across, across what was the Roman Empire at that point. So the way I'm going to frame this, and you know, you can feel free to argue. I, I, you know, this is just just one sort of interpretive approach. Is is to look at the development of Christianity in 500-year sections. So, at least according to Phyllis Tickle, the historian and sociologist, um, she she sees this lovely pattern in church history in this book, The Great Emergence, sees this pattern of something really disruptive happening in Christian history every 500 years. And I'd never thought about it until reading that book, you know, but you, you can kind of see what she's doing here. So if, if Jesus is the beginning, 500 years later, you have all these churches across the Roman Empire kind of realizing we need to be on the same page. <laughs> And especially if we're an imperial church, oh my goodness, it would be handy if we all you know, sort of believed roughly the same thing and maybe even worshipped roughly the same way. Um, and so there's this history of the what they would call the consolidation of orthodoxy, and we're not going to go through what happened at each of these councils, and there are more councils than, than those, but those are some of the major ones. Working out, trying to figure out, okay, there's God. There's Jesus. Who, who is Jesus? And what's his relationship to God? Is Jesus a really good human? Or is Jesus God pretending to be human, but not actually human? Or is Jesus both human and divine? And the short answer <laughs> is C. He's human and divine. That's what, that's what consolidated as orthodoxy. But along the way, you know, the people like the Arians, for example, who would have said, um, and then that this is what spurred the Council of Nicaea, the Arians, this group of folks in the church, saying, well, no, he's not, he's not divine. He's the best human God ever created <clears throat> and absolutely worthy of following, but not God. Only God is God. And there's a certain logic to that. But the finding of the church um, that resulted in what we would call the Nicene Creed is this belief that, oh, the God as we understand God is a, is a trinity, is a, an entity that is three in one and one in three and in relationship in itself, in God's self, as well as being in relationship with creation and humanity. And that's interesting. What, do, what does that say about theology? And so all, all of what, what these councils then ended up figuring out is, okay, if that's true, What's the nature of Jesus? If he's, if he's part of the Trinity, well, are, are, are there two natures within Jesus that are mixed up in some way? Or um, is he, does he have both human and divine uh, natures that sort of are in conflict with each other? How does that, how does that work out? Anyway, the the councils, especially the Council of Chalcedon in 451, uh, they come up with a statement of, of Jesus's nature being both fully human and fully divine all at the same time, and it's a mystery. And if you, if you push to me, at least if you push any theological question too far or as, as far as you can push it, where you're going to get is it's a mystery. That's the last answer. So any, any, any answer you want to ask about God, the last answer is it's a mystery. But there's all kinds of wonderful conversation to be had along the way before you get to the ultimate conclusion. It's a mystery. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. So all that is happening in the first 500 years of church history. And then 476 or so, depending on what, you, what event you want to date, Rome falls, which is a pretty major upheaval in church history and all the rest of European history. Um, for Rome to, to, to fall to the barbarian, which meant not Roman, <laughs> the invaders. Um, anyway, so then, any sense of what might have come next? Anybody remember from you know, college history what happened around 1,000 or so in church history? The Great Schism, bum, 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 which always sounded to me like, 
the name of a magician or something, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's the event, uh, 1054, where the two, what we know now is the Western Church and the Eastern Church, divorced. Um, the, the Pope um, excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople and vice versa. Um, And why? Well, okay, there, there were theological differences, kind of. I mean, there were theological differences, but not worth splitting. Um, you, you may or may not remember or recognize this language from the Nicene Creed um, in, the, in the paragraph about the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, period, said the Eastern Church or who proceeds from the Father and the Son, said the Western Church. Is that really worth splitting over? <laughs> I mean, uh, a, a theology of double procession or single procession, I mean, okay. And, and uh, another time, another situation, it might be interesting to think about who cares, you know, and, and why might you see it one way or the other? Well, like the Gospel of John, for example, has several instances where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit proceeding from him, you know, coming into the world with his death and that sort of thing. So you can make a case, yeah, proceeding from the Father and the Son, or you make a pretty good logical case that, you know, the, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> My point is it doesn't matter, actually. The filioque clause, yeah. as they say, that's not enough to split a church over. What was really going on? What was really going on was power. Woo! Surprise, <laughs> the church is splitting about power issues. Gosh, who could imagine such a thing as that? Um, and so the power in this case, you know, maybe kind of obviously is Rome, the center of the church and the center of the empire for a long time has been overrun by the barbarians. Constantinople is now the, the center of the empire. I mean, the, the power center of the empire the Bishop of Rome, not surprisingly, didn't really want to give up his power. Um, so rather than working it out, and, and I mean, I'm being flip about it, w with Rome falling, there, there's like no communication between East and West for hundreds of years because civilization has you know, sort of fallen off the cliff, or at least Roman civilization has fallen off the cliff in the West. Anyway, the church splits. Um, to such a degree that by the by the point, which crusade was it? The Fourth Crusade, um, 1202, the Crusaders, I mean, this is awful, the Crusaders heading to the Holy Land to kill the Muslims, which is bad enough, got distracted on the way and stopped in Constantinople and sacked the Christians in Constantinople, hating them just as much as they hated the Muslims. So what, what great history we have there. Anyway, this is what it resulted in, is kind of what we know now as, you know, the Roman Catholic Church in Western Europe and the Eastern, the very branches of Orthodoxy, Russian, Greek, Serbian, all that, um, in the East of Europe. Okay, 500 years later, we get the Reformation. Yay, the Reformation. Well, depends who you are, whether it's yay, the Reformation, but, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me. There are kind of two, well, you could look at it as more than two, but there are at least two reformations that matter maybe for us. Uh, on the continent, you know, you have Martin Luther, you've got Ulrich Zwingli, the name I can never quite pronounce very well, um, John Calvin and other folks, you know, rebelling theologically against what they perceived as either misunderstandings or misdeeds of the church, we would now call the Catholic Church. So it is a bottom-up movement. You know, you had people rebelling against the institution, raging against the man, you know. Um, in England, the Reformation was a very different thing. It did not happen that way, and we'll talk about this much more. It happened from the top down. It was a kind of hierarchical revolution, if you want to look at it that way. And it was every bit as messy, just differently messy, than the revolution um, happening from the bottom up on the continent. But what that resulted in, and this isn't, you know, of course, the, this 
Due to space limitations, this chart shows <laughs> only a few of the major offshoots. But even, even you know, the simplified version, wow. So you have, you know, the great schism up there at the top, 1054, and then Martin Luther posts his theses in 1517, and from that branch comes the Lutheran Church and the Anabaptist traditions of um, the Mennonites and uh, Quakers and folks like that, um, and the Calvinists, Presbyterians, the Reformed tradition kind of break off from there. Meanwhile, the Anglicans are breaking off from the Catholic Church, again, in a very different way, which we'll look at in a minute. And from the Anglicans come the Methodists and other holiness traditions. And from that, you get the Pentecostal movement. It, you know, and it's still doing it because humans are humans, and we want to be in charge. And so if I don't like the way you're doing church, I'll go break off and form my own, right? It's sad, but it's also what gives us the richness of denominational diversity. So there are people who are really attracted to a sacramental tradition like what we do and people who really aren't, and we can all find God through those different avenues, and that's fine. That's cool. We, we, I should say out loud, Episcopalians do not pretend like we have all the answers. Okay? <laughs> so just know that. Um, it's not like we think this is the one way everybody should be. That's, in fact, just the opposite of kind of our, our gig. Okay, so the Reformation in England. <laughs> it's an interesting story. Be because, it, because it, well, oh, back up. It starts with somebody, I don't have a picture of him yet, but somebody um, who you will know from popular culture, Henry VIII, right? Who founded the Anglican Church, the Church of England? Well, the, the, the name that usually gets applied as an answer to that is Henry VIII, which is pretty ironic. And I imagine Henry VIII spins in his grave every time anybody says anything like that, because Henry VIII was the least, the person least interested in reform on the planet. He had no interest in breaking away from Catholicism. However, it turned out he had every interest in breaking away from the Pope. <laughs> Because, again, it's about power. So Henry was very happy to be a devout you know, follower of traditional Western European Christianity right up until he wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn because Catherine of Aragon hadn't had a boy and Anne was pretty and, you know, the story. Um, <clears throat> so he writes to the Pope, you know, seeking an annulment of his marriage. In that moment, so this is divorce from Catherine of Aragon, he's asking for Aragon's in Spain. Well, Catherine of Aragon's, what's the relationship? Nephew. Catherine's nephew is Emperor Charles V of Spain. Charles's army surrounds Rome. The Pope is disinclined to <laughs> grant Henry's request <laughs> because he had guns or arrows or spears or something trained on him. Um, so he kind of just putzed around and didn't give Henry a straight answer for a really long time, such that Henry decided, I'm just going to start my, I'm, I'm not I'm going to start my own church. That is not true. Henry did not want to start his own church. He wanted to take over his own church. So what would this have been, 1532 or so, 1532 to 1534, Parliament passes bills saying, well, Turns out the Pope is not in charge of the church in England. Instead, the sovereign is in charge of the church in England. Thus we say, and so it is, which transferred vast amounts of wealth <laughs> and power to Henry from the Pope. Not that the Pope had anything that he could do about it at that point. Um, but Parliament declares that the, the king, the sovereign, is the supreme head in earth of the church in England. So the Church of England begins by decree of Parliament. So in all that, Henry still has no interest whatsoever in reform. He's not looking to change theology or the practice of worship or anything. He just wants it himself. Henry dies in 1547, 
and his son, who's nine years old, Edward VI, comes to the throne. Nine-year-olds tend not to, you know, know enough to rule quite yet. So he has advisors, regents, whatever, who are ruling for him. And Edward's advisors, regents, that kind of people, they are Protestant. They are not traditional. They're among the folks who want to break away. So what that gives us, <laughs> in, this is in the category of in all things God works for good, <laughs> even ugly, messy stuff, God works for good. What that gives us is the Book of Common Prayer. Because the way the Reformation in England played itself out, at least first, was in moving worship into the people's language. This was revolutionary. This was not a thing anybody was accustomed to. Worship was in Latin. And there are reasons for that, because if the church is across you know, multiple languages, I mean areas of multiple languages, it's nice to have a common language to do worship in. So that kind of made some sense. But there also was the desire on people's parts, especially as modernism is becoming a thing you know, in that period of time, that people wanted to be able to worship in their own tongue, just like most of us want to be able to worship in our own language. So that was revolutionary. The other, another revolution out of the Book of Common Prayer was that the people could receive communion. So we'll talk about this in another class, but before that, the way the people received communion was by the priest holding up a chalice and letting you look at it, holding up bread and letting you look at it, and thus you have received communion. <laughs> Hope you had a good time. See you next week. So that changed so that people, normal people, regular people, could receive the Eucharist, which is also a big deal. Um, so that was edited, put together, translated and edited by Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, a, a, a genius as a writer. And, and the, the beauty of many of these old prayers that you know even even in a modern reworking still carries the flower of Elizabethan English it's Cranmer who did that it's Cranmer's ear and pen that gave us those prayers um, but the, the new Book of Common Prayer had a shelf life of a grand total of three years because it wasn't reformed enough for Edward and his advisors they were looking for something that the first prayer book you know, didn't really change a lot in terms of theology. This was still, you know, Jesus' body and blood that we're giving you. Well, the reformers in the Church of England were not interested in that. They disagreed and thought this is, no, following, um, you know, Calvin, for example, primarily Calvin. Um, this is not Jesus' body and blood we're giving you. This is a memorial meal that's helping us remember that Jesus died for us but this is bread and wine that we're giving you. So there starts this um, ongoing conversation or conflict about what is this that we're actually receiving when we get communion. But anyway, the second Book of Common Prayer was much more reformed, um, said things like you, you priests are not to wear, clergy are not to wear vestments, there are not to be candles on altars, uh, the bread and the wine are bread and wine, you, you may not um, reverence it, worship it, so to speak, in, in the way that one would revere the Blessed Sacrament in Catholic tradition and in a lot of Episcopal tradition now even. Um, it's like, nope, can't do any of that. We are following the Reformed path along with the folks on the continent. Okay. Unfortunately, whoops, I didn't have that up there. Unfortunately, this did not, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you look at it, this didn't last either because Edward VI died the next year. He was always sickly, and I can't remember what it was he died from. But I mean, he was just a, not a well person, even from you know infancy. Um, and he's come to something. Well, so the crown passes to his sister, Queen Mary. If you've heard of Bloody Mary, this is this is Queen Mary. Well. So, whoops, still not yet, sorry. Mary halted all of what I've just been describing, <laughs> and she said, nope, 
we're going back under the Pope. Cancel all that Book of Common Prayer stuff. Cancel all the re reformed elements of Anglican worship at that point. We're going back to the way things were when my dad, Henry VIII, was king. The best, the best things, I'm still in charge of the church, but we're going to follow worship the way we used to and theology the way we used to. Okay, so everybody reoriented and, <clears throat> um, well, not everybody. Some, some people reoriented with that. <clears throat> I'll show you a picture here in just a second. Um, other people stuck with their Reformed theology and their Reformed practice and paid the price and were burned at the stake. So I'll just go to it, including three guys in Salisbury, England, one of whom is an ancestor of mine, um, who were burned at the stake there by the cathedral in 1556 during Bloody Mary's time. But of course, you know, once, oh, uh, so I should say, that's 1556, that's in the, in the, the, uh, the height of the, the purge of the, re the reformers in the church. Well, Mary also died relatively young. Mary only lived, let's see, well, she only reigned in 1553 to 1558 because she got stomach cancer. So Mary dies, and the crown goes to Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, Mary's sister, third in line from Henry. Well, Elizabeth, I, I love Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a genius in a lot of ways. Um, particularly in terms of ruling, <laughs> in terms of the exercise of power, Elizabeth was amazing. Um, she took everything back in the Protestant direction. But what she said was, okay, we can't do any more of this. No, no more Protestants killing Catholics when they're in power and Catholics killing Protestants when they're in power. Stop it. Everybody stop it. We're going back, you know, push reset. The, the sovereign is in charge of the church, just like Henry said, <laughs> and we're going to follow, we're all going to follow the Book of Common Prayer as the way that we worship, whether you like it or not. So the prayer book was revised, and this lovely um, legislation we refer to as the Elizabethan Settlement um, came down that said the queen's in charge, and we will all worship according to the Book of Common Prayer. But she also recognized that's not going to convince everybody, you know, just because the prayer book says this is the body and blood of Christ or whatever, you know, that doesn't mean everybody's going to believe it. So she took the perspective that we're all going to worship the same way and you can pretty much believe what you want to believe. She said something like, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I shall not attempt to open windows into men's souls or something like that. She, she just like, I don't care what you believe, <laughs> actually. I care how you worship, and you're all going to worship the way I tell you to, and we're going to have peace because Elizabeth was busy, you know, trying to conquer the Spaniards and the other things that were occupying her energies other than fighting church battles. It was a pretty good solution, but... Well, Practically, it was a fabulous solution. It turned off the bloodshed and solidified Elizabeth's power. But it also set this really interesting DNA for us as Episcopalians. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a practical thing, I think, for Elizabeth in some way to say, we're not going to worry if everybody is on the same page theologically, that that's not the most important thing, that worshiping together is the most important thing. So that had kind of a ugly power mongering sense to it in the day but if you take that into the future it brings us to a point where we're not going to say um, in an Episcopal congregation we're not going to say you must believe X Y and Z there, there is not a catechism like this in our tradition that tells you precisely what you need to think about Jesus's relation to the Holy Spirit or you know whatever the thing is we, we would ground, we do ground, um, our theology in the ancient creeds. God is a trinity. Jesus, 
human and divine, you know, the, the basic claims of historical Christianity. We're all about that. But past that, we're not going to say you have to have a doctrine of salvation like this. You have to have a doctrine of the Holy Spirit like this. No. What's more interesting, actually, is the conversation that comes out of that, we, we would say. So being able to entertain, to hold in tension different views of theology, at least historically, has also allowed us to come together in worship, come together in community, even if we don't believe the same thing on a lot of levels, not just theology, but politics or public policy or um, whatever. Um, it, it, it is a hallmark of this tradition that is hard to claim in this day and age, but still is there, that we don't have to be on the same page in order to be in community, which makes things really messy and really fabulous, I think. You know, at our best, to be able to sit down with somebody who voted just the opposite of you <laughs> on everything <laughs> and be able to have a great conversation and a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and a dinner and and then come together around the altar and remember that it's Jesus' presence that is what's binding us together, not what we think. Because we're not going to think it all right anyway, being limited human beings. Anyway, off my soapbox, sorry. But Elizabeth gave us that, or at least the start of it, that, oh, that would be a way you could do church. Okay, so it's just kind of, I think it's interesting to think about you know, who's, who's, the, who's the founder of the Anglican movement? I, it's not him. <laughs> so, no. Thomas Cranmer, well, you can make a case writing or editing and translating the Book of Common Prayer. Yeah, that was a pretty big piece of defining who we are as Episcopalians and historically as Anglicans. So, yeah, maybe. You can make a really good case too, for Elizabeth being the founder of Anglicanism, the founder of the church as we know it. You could also make a good case uh, for this guy, Richard Hooker, who I haven't mentioned yet, but Anglican theologian after, well, during Elizabeth's reign, but after all this had happened, who kind of staked out explicitly what it meant to be this English expression of Christianity that wasn't Roman Catholic, and wasn't Protestant like they were doing it on the continent, but this thing in the middle, a via media, a middle way. That's, that's his, his language. He's also the person from whom we get the um, a th a theology, and a practical theology of what are the sources of authority for the church. And this matters, too, in that time, because the Roman Catholic side would have said, well, it's the Pope, you know, it's the church hierarchy. The church hierarchy tells us what to think and authorizes what we do. The reformers on the continent would have said, it's the Bible. Forget the tradition, forget the Pope, forget, you know, there are nice things about it, but it's not determinative of who we are. The Bible is determinative of who we are. And Hooker would have said, yes. <laughs> yes to both of those. Scripture, absolutely, the primary source of authority. Tradition, a huge source of authority, because we've had, by that point, 1,593 years of it, uh, by Hooker's time. Um, but also, he identified the third one, reason, which is a little shocking and very cool, I think, that uh, these three legs of the stool are equally important tradition really matters. It informs us about who we've been and where we've come from and there's brilliance and divinity in that reflection over the, over the centuries. Scripture is scripture. I mean, it's, it's huge, fundamental. And how we think and reason and converse and understand, it's how we make sense of those things. It's, it's how those things come into being among us. How those things have a have practical application among us. So he, he identified that, and that is a huge piece of an Anglican identity, that it isn't either or, it's both, and the reason that it takes to bring them together and live them out. Okay.
I am, and I should have said this before, I'm sorry. Um, please stop me anytime. I get on a roll with this stuff because there's so much try, uh, to, to, to cover in a short amount of time. But before, before we embark into the British Empire, wh what do you think about any of that? That, that, that sense of an identity of a middle way, of a, a three-legged stool of authority, what, how, how does that, how, how is that for you now? Is that crazy? Is that um, sort of second nature? I mean, how, how, do, how, do, how do those conversations, how, is any of that operative for you now in your experience? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay. I found myself wondering what happened to Cranmer. I know what happened to Cranmer, but I wonder if you could just... Oh, I didn't say. Yeah. yeah. So Cranmer was, a, Thomas Cranmer was among the people um, killed during Mary's purge of the Protestants when the church had become Catholic again. Uh, and, and other um, reformed leaders, too, or even not so reformed. I mean, Cranmer wasn't a I was going to say flaming, but that's bad because he was set on fire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he wasn't a strong Protestant, really. I mean, his, his theology was pretty traditional. Putting it in English wasn't traditional, and giving people bread and wine at communion wasn't traditional. But, I mean, he was not a you know, renegade reformer at all. But he was an, and, 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 but he was enough of one having, having you know, Created the book, he was enough of one for Mary to silence. I, I, John, I have a question about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like it was the Anglicans that decided to give bread and wine. At least, yeah, in England, right. In England, but then Catholics at some point made the switch. Yeah, and I don't know when that would have, anybody, anybody know? Any Catholic wrote that tradition? question down so I could Google it later. <laughs> yeah, huh? yeah when, did, when did that happen? That's a, that's a I don't know that we, we were the leaders in this, but uh, it's, it's interesting because. Yeah, I, I wonder yeah. if it was, you know, Council of Trent, if it was a counter-reformation, but I don't know that. Hmm. I don't know that. That's a, that's a great question. Susan will find out. <laughs> Father Google. It's a race. Yes, Father Google. What does Father Google say? That's right. No, it's a great question. Um, and, and the Reformed churches, excuse me, on the continent, I, I think did the same thing. Gave, gave people both kinds, communion of both kinds. What they thought it meant was another question. Or whether they did it at all. I mean, like, well, I won't get it right. Some, some of the branches of the Reformation just stop doing communion. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, that's it was primarily adopted in Vatican II. Yeah. It was Council of Trent. Council of Trent, <laughs> yeah. Google <laughs> disagrees <laughs> on this point. <laughs> what? Vatican II sounds so late. So what? I, I, Just, uh, I would be surprised if it was Vatican II. That's very late in yeah. time. No, it's, no, it wasn't. I'm also curious with, yeah. I don't know if this was touched on, but how in the Catholic Church you have to be a member of the Catholic Church in order to receive communion, yes. sure. whereas yeah. like the Episcopal Church, you don't have to be, and right. th that's something that I was familiar with from growing up. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, when did that have, well, so when it, that's a relatively recent um, innovation maybe. Or a progressive invasion, I guess. I mean, when I was growing up, we had to be confirmed in order to receive communion. As it is now, you just have to be baptized. But you had to be 
confirmed to, be, to receive communion, which meant by default you had to be an Episcopalian, because that's what being confirmed was, you know. But with, with the new prayer book, which isn't new anymore, but we still like to call it that, the new prayer book from 1979, um, yeah, I mean, it says explicitly, baptism is full membership in the church, completely full membership. So you don't have to do anything other than be baptized. Father John, so did you all have First Communion in the Episcopal Church as a child? I, where I grew up did not, but a lot of, a lot of places did. In fact... I found I saw in the archives here once. I should have pulled the thing because it's such a great picture. It says so much. A, a photo of the confirmation class at St. Andrews in it was probably 1950 something. It was that kind of a picture, with them all dressed in cap and gown, like graduating. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> at the communion rail, oh, wow. in cap and gown. So it was marking their graduation into adulthood as a confirmed person at 12 or whatever, you know, and, and their ability finally to receive. It's a great picture. I wish I'd stolen it. Um, I don't even know where it is now. But anything else? What else? Anything else people want to ask? So I'm sorry to a better answer. Um, to the Roman Catholic tradition is not the only one where that's the case. The, the Orthodox would say that too, that you've got to be a member of the Orthodox Church in order to receive. The Missouri Synod Lutherans would say that too. Probably so other the normal people. to me is not the normal historically. Well, yeah. Okay. I didn't know if that was something during the, the schism thing. No. There, it, we, 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 stayed in, we stayed as a tribe <laughs> a long time. I mean, really the that, again, it's a small thing, but it's not a small thing. For the prayer book to define full membership in the church as simply being baptized, what that means is anybody who's been baptized is a full member of that church if they want to be. And, that, and practically, that's the case for you. I mean, one of the questions that often comes in this class is, okay, so what do I need to do to be a member? If I want to be a member, what is that? Do I have to be confirmed? Do I? No. All you have to do is say, make me a member. And if you're baptized, you are. If, you're, if you haven't been baptized, we would love to take you on that journey and have you baptized, um, and then you're a member. But, but being baptized is all it takes since 1979. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Here's the British Empire, maybe at its height, or at least close to its height. This, this matters kind of in relation to, uh, to some images we'll see in a minute. But the reason that's up here is this church that Elizabeth created, maybe you could say, that's the church that the Brits took with them everywhere they went, which is why there is an Anglican communion now, why there is a network of churches that are tied together by history um, flowing from a book like this um, that got planted in all these different places. So that now there is an Anglican church in Kenya and an Anglican church in South Africa and an Anglican church of Australia. All those places have Anglican churches. And if you walked into them, other than the language being different, it would feel a whole lot like you know, what's happening in there on a Sunday morning. So one of the places it went, <laughs> obviously, is here, where we are. So how did we get here as Episcopalians? Well. It's a little messy, but, but here's a good way into it. What, what, what do you think the English were trying to do related to faith and colonization? What was their intent as they took their faith with them colonizing? Could you say the Great Commission? <laughs> you could say the Great Commission, but actually you'd be wrong. You, you, you'd hope it'd be the Great Commission, right? Go and you know, baptize and teach and all that. Actually, what they were doing was taking their church on the road so they could have church. And it was nice when other people wanted to come and play, but it wasn't really the intent. Um, it, was, it was taking England and picking it up and 
setting it down in Jamestown or Cape Town or wherever they happen to find themselves. So how that played out here, always good to ask, where's the power? We're talking about church. Where's the power? Well, in the colonies, in the southern colonies, mid-Atlantic and southern colonies, the Anglicans were, they had a lot of power. Um, and were a religious majority in places like Virginia. Um, <laughs> they enjoyed autonomy. They did not have, there were no bishops as part of colonial churches, and they liked it that way, by golly, because they could do whatever they wanted, really, uh, and be in control and not be answering. I mean, you know, there was a bishop officially over them, but not exercising any real oversight. Um, and those folks leaned toward revolution when the time came. This, you can't read it, but the cartoon that Jen found, I don't know, where, where'd you find that? Depths of the Web in Archive. The Depths of the Web, okay. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It's a great cartoon. The title down here is An Attempt to Land a Bishop in America. <laughs> So here's the bishop crawling up the mast, you know, trying to get away from the angry crowd that is shoving him back out to sea. I love that. And you have flags saying things like, um, no lords, spiritual or temporal, in New England. Liberty and freedom of conscience. Um, Shall, oh, and down here, cast aside. Shall they be obliged to maintain bishops that cannot maintain themselves? <laughs> and the bishop climbing the ropes is saying, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I love that. So, you know, the folks in Virginia around there, not, not so interested in having Episcopal authority. Episcopal, by the way, we'll probably say this more often, more than once, the word Episcopal, it just means bishop, of bishops. It's an adjective relating to bishops. So we're the bishops church, the church of bishops. That's, that's what the name means. Anyway, so in the South, Anglicans had a lot of power. Who needed help? Anglicans in the North, <laughs> where they were not a majority. And all those pesky Congregationalists, the Puritans, you know, they were the ones in charge, right? Um, so the folks, the Anglicans in the north needed support from bishops, needed to, it was helpful to have the crown on your side <laughs> if you're a majority, I mean a minority. And so, gosh, they were more likely to be loyal when revolution mm -hmm. came. And many of them skedaddled to Canada at that point. Um, anyway, revolution came. Some folks skedaddled to Canada, some people got tarred and feathered, and some people went back to England, and some people stayed as um, members of the Church of England, but that gets messy when there isn't an England anymore. I mean, if the country isn't England anymore and you're the Church of England, now what? I mean, it was really, it was like an existential crisis for the church, but they had no idea what to do. Th th those who remained, agreed on this much, they, they needed a way to govern themselves because suddenly they were divorced from the structure of the church in England. And they needed a prayer book because the English prayer book prayed for the king, for one thing. So yeah, that didn't go so well. I mean, you could just take a pencil and you know scratch that out. But, they, but they, the other problem is um, ordination rites in the prayer book required an oath of allegiance to the sovereign. And you couldn't really stand up and say that if you just, you know, fought a revolution. Fought a revolution, <laughs> right? It didn't go over so well. Um, but they did not agree about bishops and apostolic succession, which is another fun term we may use more than once here. That that is a relatively simple concept expressed <laughs> in a fancy way. That's what we do. Um, it, it just means that. Apostolic succession means that a person who has been ordained has been ordained in a line of people who have been ordained going back to the apostles. So the apostles, 
spread the church and ordained folks who ordained folks who ordained folks who ordained folks who ordained, folks who ordained me. Uh, the, the Episcopal Church is in apostolic succession because we didn't stop having bishops. The churches that stopped having bishops aren't in, in that same line. And that's, I mean, to me, that's not bad. It just is a, it just is a thing. But you know, apostolic succession is a, a traditional hallmark of, one of the hallmarks of what it means to be um, part of this, this tradition. So OK, and it's something they disagreed about. Was it necessary? And it mattered in the moment, because if you were going to maintain apostolic succession, you needed to be ordained. You needed to ordain people in this new church, in this new land, by bishops. I mean, a bishop needed to be the one who was going to come and lay on hands and ordain people. But there weren't any bishops. And they couldn't go to England and do it, because they'd have to swear an oath of allegiance to the sovereign. You know, Plus, the bishops in England are like, yeah, no, we don't really want to have anything to do with you. Thank you. So, like the Methodists, for example, solved this problem by saying, "Never mind. We'll, we we'll yeah, we'll, we'll ordain people without bishops. That's okay." And that there are bishops in the Methodist Church, but it doesn't work quite the same way uh, as in this one. Um, so, the the church here raised up this gentleman named Samuel Seabury, um, Bishop of Connecticut. I'm pretty sure it's Connecticut. I think it's Connecticut. It became, he was in Connecticut, he was a priest in Connecticut, became um, voted, whatever, named to, to, be, to be the bishop. And so he went to Scotland. And you wonder, why did he go to Scotland? Well, so archaic British history, um, you may remember or may not remember that the Brits got rid of the house of Stuart, the uh, they, they, they killed one of them, and then there was the restoration, and they brought the Stuarts back, and the later Stuarts weren't any better than the earlier Stuarts, and they got rid of the second Stuarts, not by killing them, but by the glorious revolution of kicking them out of the country, and bringing in William and Mary from the Netherlands to be the sovereigns. They were related. Anyway, there were bishops in Scotland called the non-jurors, which just means people who won't swear an oath, the, 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 Scot, the Scottish bishops, not surprisingly, given that it was the House of Stuart that got kicked out, the, the Scottish bishops said, no, we're still loyal to the, to the House of Stuart. We're not going to swear an oath of allegiance to the House of Orange. Who are those people? You know. So they were OK with not swearing an oath of allegiance to the king, because they wouldn't swear an oath of allegiance to the king. They stopped doing that when James II got booted out, or Charles II. Charles II got booted out. Anyway, so Seabury goes to Scotland and gets himself consecrated. The, the deal was, part of the deal was, the Scottish bishops said, okay, if you're creating your new prayer book, we want you to use our Eucharistic prayer. The, the prayer that consecrates the bread and wine. We'll, we'll, we'll make you a bishop, but we want you to use our, our prayer um, in your new book. So that's where it came from, actually. Anyway, um, so we created a constitution for a new church and created our own Book of Common Prayer, which was remarkably similar to the English book, except it didn't swear an oath of allegiance to the king and that kind of thing. Anyway, that created the Episcopal Church in this country. But it is interesting to look at the Episcopal Church now. In, in a not so long ago earlier day, the name of this denomination officially was the Episcopal Church in the United States of America, ECUSA. It's not, it doesn't call that anymore because it's not just in the United States of America. And I will not remember all the places that it is, so I will look at my notes. There are Episcopal churches, not like other branches of the Anglican Communion, but parishes of the Episcopal Church in Haiti, Cuba, Micronesia, Taiwan, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Honduras, Venezuela, and this convocation of Episcopal churches in England, I mean in, in Europe, which are primarily there for expatriates, you know, for the Episcopalians who've gone to live in Europe for one reason or another. So you can go to the Episcopal Cathedral in Paris when you're there. It's not quite as nice as Notre Dame, but you know, not bad. <laughs> It has a roof. 
Sorry. Oh, 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 oh. too soon. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was that loud, wasn't it? Angela Lansbury used to be the lecturer there. Did she really? Yes. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that, that would have been fun to hear the lessons read by Angela Lansbury. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so that's the Episcopal Church. There are, what, 111, I think it is? 111 dioceses in the Episcopal Church. A diocese is a subdivision, like a geographical subdivision of church, same as in the Catholic Church um, and other traditions too. A, a diocese is the territory that a bishop oversees. So this is the Diocese of West Missouri. If you drive three quarters of a mile that way, you enter the Diocese of Kansas, which, I mean, in its day, it made, in my opinion, this is me, um, this made good sense. So like the Diocese of West Missouri split off from the Diocese of all of Missouri in 1892, I think it was, because it was hard for the bishop to get around from St. Louis to, you know, Springfield and Kansas City and St. Joe. And, you know, if you're on a horse or whatever, it's not convenient. And the church was growing and planting and all, you know, huge missional energy. It was a great time. Now, of course, you know, you can drive from one end of Missouri to the other in five and a half hours or something, six hours. So, and there are lots of dioceses like ours that split off from a larger diocese at some point in their history. Um, so it's sort of an active question in the church at this point. Would it make sense to reconsolidate so to speak. For example, the Lutherans, the, the ELCA, Lutherans, uh, their bishop covers all of Kansas and all of Missouri. Mm. They make it work. <laughs> you know, we could... It saves a lot of money. It saves a lot of money, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's another conversation. But there are lots of dioceses. How many should there be? That's another question. <laughs> How are we governed? Okay, we're doing okay on time. Okay, so... The Episcopal Church is, is overseen by this thing called General Convention, which meets every three years. Uh, we'll meet um, this, this, this coming summer, uh, a year from now. Um, there are three, <clears throat> well, there are two houses, meets every three years. There are two houses. There is a House of Deputies and a House of Bishops. This, this I know this is just like church polity wonkiness, but it does actually have some, some relevance. If that sounds familiar, a bicameral legislature of people of different stations, so to speak, it, it might well be familiar because many of the same folks who created the federal government, the constitution for the federal government, created the constitution for the Episcopal Church. So the House of Deputies is kind of like the House of Representatives. It is made up of um, lay people and deacons and priests and elected by the conventions of the various dioceses. So like our convention here elected eight people to go be our representatives to the House of Deputies. So very democratic. Then there's also a House of Bishops, kind of like the Senate, where each diocese, no matter how big it is, small it is, whatever, has equal representation. There's a bishop for each diocese. Um, so anyway, and there's a person, the presiding bishop, who, who is, doesn't have the power of, you know, an executive in the way we would often think of an executive having power. It's much more spiritual and symbolic leadership, but that person convenes the House of Bishops, and so that's, you know, there's, there's power and authority in that. And there's this, there's a body called the Executive Council, which is like, the vestry of a church, that's the vestry of the national church, of the general church. Okay, so last slide, you'll be happy to know. Um, I think it's interesting to think about who, who came out on top. Um, there are you know, these different ways of seeing who we are as church. There are different ways of understanding the theology of, of um, say, the, the theology of the sacrament. 
Um, there's certainly different ways of worshiping, different styles of worshiping. So I would be interested to see what you think about these questions. So who, who won? <laughs> the, the low church, the, the folks in the South, and it's not you know strictly this way, but the, the evangelical side of the church, the, um, the the side of the church that does not lean so heavily on ritual in worship, that would not adorn um, the building in uh, quite as richly, would not care so much about their vestments. You know, doesn't matter how many candles are lit, that kind of thing. Um, that that's sort of how the church manifested itself, especially in the South and growing out from there. Not simply limited to the north, but uh, more the, the, the north um, side of the church became much more, well, or were people who were much more interested in sacramentality, um, the, the outward and visible manifestation of, uh, of God's grace in worship. So for, for those folks, it matters a lot that ritual is observed precisely and um, beauty and the aesthetic of worship is, is a really important part of the experience of going to church. There, you hear people chanting perhaps the entire liturgy, the entire service, or at least a whole lot more of it than we would chant here. Um, the, the doctrine of the Eucharist, you know, what, what is it that we're looking at here, would perhaps be closer to a Roman Catholic understanding than a Reformed understanding. Um, so that, that's, there's that kind of party in church history. And then there are the folks in the middle, and I love this term, the latitudinarians, only, <laughs> only folks descended from English stock would come up with a name like the Latitudinarians. But that's the people in the middle. So the folks who are, you know, borrowing from both sides, so to speak, or not, not to the extreme of either way. Is that St. Andrew's Latitudinarians? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. First of all, I would say who won the battle. They all did because they're all still there. But, but I am curious, not just to St. Andrew's, but in your experience uh, just generally of of the Episcopal Church or other of other um, worship traditions, what what have you experienced? Start with what do you, what do you see here? Where do you think we fall in this kind of a I don't know way of understanding the differences? Where are we? I see it's this latitude. We're upper middle latitude. <laughs> <laughs> We're upper middle latitude. <laughs> We're between those two, whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. High latitude. High latitudinarians. <laughs> Upper middle. Yeah. There we go. Stratospheric. Once again, let me show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, how how often do you do smells and bells? Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. So smells and bells would be shorthand for the the more Anglo-Catholic approach to worship with yeah. incense. That's the smells, incense, and. Um, a lot of places, some places still, yeah, use sanctus bells in worship, so in particular points in the service when the priest is uh, saying the prayer of consecration, there are certain moments where bells are rung, um, and we'll talk about that in the instructed Eucharist, yeah. actually. But so for us, yeah. we actually don't use sanctus bells at all, not because I don't like sanctus bells, but just because when I came into this place 18 years ago, they hadn't used a sanctus bell in generations probably yeah, and sure. I didn't care that much to bring it in but we, we do incense on uh, major feasts but in, in, in the latitudinarian tradition we do incense at the 1015 service and don't do it at the 8 o'clock service because some people hate incense so okay that's fine if you don't like incense come to the 8 o'clock that's cool and the irony is the 8 o'clock is usually a higher <laughs> service you'd think that would be true yeah. You would think that would be true. The 8 o'clock service, if you haven't been, is right one. So that's the, the Elizabethan language of the prayer book. You would think that would be the traditionalists, and some of them are. When I talk to people about why they go to what service, they go, it's all about time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They want to get out early. 
they want to get on with their day. It's really not about <laughs> liturgical niceties. It's, yeah. yeah. We used to call it Eucharist Express. Eucharist Express. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's no music, right? Nice. I haven't been to the Well, Eucharist we do have music. We do have music. Oh, you have it's some music. Well, not, okay. not full. But not yeah, choir. not a full choir. It, it is, is a song. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a shorter service. It is a sh slightly, short, yeah. yeah. A little bit, but yeah. So we do on on major feasts so like Christmas and Easter and Pentecost and All Saints. We'll do we'll do incense. Yeah. And we call the alarm company. Yeah, we call, we try to remember to call the alarm company and have them not deploy the fire department because we put smoke in the air. Yeah, but but not just where do you think we are, but what is meaningful to you about worship or about theological understandings, for that matter. But, I mean, where, where do you find yourself in that kind of a spectrum? I, I like the fact that St. Andrew's is kind of latitudinarian because I, I kind of wiggle around in my, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm always okay at St. Andrew's if I go this way or this way a little bit in my thinking or my theological musings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not told you're... you're, you're, you're Stop that. Yeah. yeah. Back in your box. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> I was a Presbyterian for many years and we got communion once a quarter. Once a quarter. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And my wife is a very devout Catholic, and I will attend church with her once in a while, and it's very uh, high church. Okay. Uh, I'm a middle child. <laughs> I like the latitudinarian <laughs> approach. Feels right to me. I love that. I'm a middle child. <laughs> it, it's interesting for me because I, I, I mentioned I spent about 15 years in the Methodist tradition. I actually... Yeah as a kid was in Church of Christ, which is oh, way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like, not a lot of sacramentality, like, huh? that, not a lot of sacraments in that. No, no, no. not a lot of, uh, not a place for women, really. Oh, well, um, we do. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I feel like I've, I've, I'm have i progressively getting higher, I suppose. <laughs> um, I mean, the Methodist Church has some, depending on how sort of traditional the church is, yeah. has some of the same, um, some of the same language and that kind of thing. And the theologically, they're very similar. But yeah. um, so I feel like I've gone a little bit further. And, and that's one of the things that actually attracted me to to coming is okay. that I do appreciate a little bit more of a liturgical feel to the service. So, yeah. Okay, if not, and if you don't want to elaborate, that's fine. Is there anything particularly about that kind of an approach to worship that connects with you? What What is it? Um, where, where do you find God in that? So I th it was interesting because when I went with Mother Jean, I said, I, I mean, I also spent time in unity, which is way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, yeah. You know, so I, I um, for me, um, I, I like the, the connection, the historical connection okay. with Christians coming before me and the fact that around the world people are practicing the same. And so... Um, and, and, and I'm sort of in a reflective period of my life, and I don't always have the words for my, my prayers. And so um, it's a way go. to have that. Yeah. Kind of on that note, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been to plenty of, I didn't grow up non-denominational like Alyssa, but I've been to plenty of those churches. And it's very, I don't want to compare it too much to like entertainment or theater, but it's like you're sitting there watching something, whereas in the Episcopal Church, you do response, you do the prayers of the people, you do the confession of sin. Uh, there's a lot of like call and response type stuff that yeah. makes it feel, I guess, more interactive, make me feel more involved than I have at other churches. Thank you for saying that out loud. That is a, and I don't mean that in a value judgment kind of way, but it is a big difference. It, you know, is worship something you watch or is worship something you're doing? And well, of course it's not that stark, but, but I mean, it, it kind of plays out that way. And I'd like to say to that, as you're sitting in the pews watching a service, look down the aisles and see how many people are moving around to make the service happen. It's not just the three or four of us that are up there investments, but there are 15 people making a service happen. It's, it's really cool. And there's a role for everyone in that. So 
it's uh, it's neat to see how much it makes. It, it all comes together because as a body, we all make it happen together. Yeah. And 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 the, the people who are in the pews, being in the pews, are also doing liturgical work. That's yeah. I mean, that's that's a huge role. So that's actually what I was saying. Um, I grew up also in the Presbyterian Church, but the more evangelical, evangelical side of the Presbyterian okay. Church, yeah. and in college I found liturgical worship, and I I do think it really did save my faith because uh, there's more meat on the bone for one thing. Yeah. Um, but that notion that you're talking about, like the work of the people, that it, it's grooving it into you. It, it's the same thing every time. And I, I had a pastor who said, "You don't get beyond a need for the gospel," and the liturgy tells you the gospel. All, over and over and over again, right. and it, and as you do liturgy, you start to move reflexively. It becomes part of who you are. It shapes you, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I found that to be really meaningful. That thank you for naming that too. Uh, and and it is interesting to think about how that plays out bodily. Um, I mean, it, there's there's the ingraining of the prayers, but there's also the sense of movement. So you, you, and we'll do this is what the instructed Eucharist is about later. You know, you come into a space, and the different parts of the space mean different things, and you do different things in different places in the building. And how how you choose to you know do you choose to do this kind of thing, and do you choose to do this kind of thing, and or not? Do you dip your finger in holy water as you come in? You know, all the, all those things are options, and they have the possibility of kind of deepening the groove or something, you know, putting even more and more into the experience of it. Yeah. I've always appreciated the music of the Episcopal Church. The hymnody is beautiful and um, the prayers as well. Yeah. I, I grew up with, you know, a tradition that was very, it had its own liturgy, so to speak. Everything was always in the same order of worship. Right, okay. But it was always... Um, from the heart, so you never had any written prayers. Mm -hmm. You just had people praying, and I got to calling them the just prayers. <laughs> just Lord, just be with us this morning. Just you know that sort of thing. Uh, and and the prayers uh, in the Episcopal Church are just so um, lovely and beautiful aesthetically, yeah. and that draws me to God more than the other type. That's and just the other side of that reality, I agree. And I'll never forget being, like I said, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. So, you know, I'm hearing these prayers from one month old, you know. Um, I will never forget being in youth group, I was probably 13 or 14 or something. And the youth group, I was, you know, there early and helping the priest do whatever we were going to do that day. And, um, and she said, well, when we get to this point and what we're going to do, why don't you offer a prayer? And I was like, what? <laughs> which, which, which one? <laughs> which one would you like me to offer? And she's like, no, that's not what I mean. <laughs> just pray. Like, I, can you do that? I mean, I really, it wasn't just, well, part of it was I didn't want to do that because that was really scary for somebody who, with no extemporaneous prayer experience. But also, I didn't know that was okay. I mean, it was so much by the book that I kind of didn't know it was all right for a 13-year-old to offer a prayer in a youth group meeting. Oh. So some, there's another place. Finding the middle way there would be a good thing. <laughs> you know, that it's good to be able to pray whatever's on your heart, absolutely. Yeah. And that this can kind of shape what goes on in your heart. I mean, God is good with it. Anyway. So we ought to go. Um, and actually, I think we're going to be cut off online here in 10 seconds or something anyway. So if you're on mic, thank you very much for being